Thanks, Christy, and welcome, Ken. Thank you for being here today, and thanks all of you for being there. It's a great, it's great to see so many of you turning out on a sunny sun Saturday when everybody probably wants to be outside doing other things. But um, before, uh, we're of course, Ken and I are going to have a chat, and um, and I'm really looking forward to that. But before we do that, we have a special surprise for you. Um, and Tom, do you want to take it away? My name is up there. <laughs> oh, Ken, your hat's in the screen. <laughs> well, I thought we had this all figured out. Can you raise it or? <clears throat> In the front? There's a knob in the front. Can you get it up? Right. Am I still blocking? If I'm this way, am I blocking? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Everything okay over there, Tom? <laughs> well, uh, 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 I wanted to introduce you to uh, Tom Palazzolo, who's at, at the projector, and he uh, graciously um, agreed to uh, help us. And he's a wonderful filmmaker has done a lot of uh, documentary films, uh, mostly uh, in Chicago, except for one in uh, Indiana, which was, uh, what was the name of that place? Uh, Nude Ranch or something? Naked City, uh, which I think isn't in existence any longer, for good reason. <laughs>
Well, maybe people could sit on other people's laps on that side. Tom, Tom's been working uh, for 40 years on, with films. <laughs> Tom was a uh, wonderful student of mine at the Art Institute, the School of the Art Institute, many years ago. <laughs> and I have a lot of stories about him, but I, that'll take another hour. This was my second and last film. Okay. <laughs> oh. Yes, wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did? I can get you. You want to? I'll get that. Um, no. 
So uh, I was gonna. So so what what did we just see there, Ken? Well, I had my back to it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what it is, though. Um, it was a, a film I, uh, I I projected a lot of films in classrooms when I was teaching at the School of the Art Institute, and uh, things would go wrong. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, the film would break or burn up or the bulb would go out or whatever, and I thought I'd make a film about the projector. Uh, so uh, this, this is the result of it. Um, and I, uh, I wanted to introduce uh, uh, an intentional break so that I, it was like the, br the film broke, you know, midway and had to be rethreaded, so there'd be a little performance like Tom has done, uh, rethreading the film. Uh, and uh, the, the projector was the uh, subject of the film. And uh, by the way, it's a 16 millimeter film, uh, and that's a 16 mil millimeter projector. And I'm tell telling you this because some of you may not be familiar with that. Um, my uh, accountant had hired this uh, young lady recently, and he was showing her around the office, uh, talking about her uh, responsibilities. And he said, and, and then we type up these checks for uh, this uh, uh, business. And uh, he took her over to the typewriter and she, she said, what is that? So that's why I'm talking about this. And so if this was your second and last film, what, what preceded this one? I did a film uh, on a destruction of a building. Uh, at, uh, it was, the title was the location, uh, 33rd and LaSalle Street. And uh, the... Uh, these buildings were being demolished uh, for the Dan Ryan Express, Expressway and displacing a lot of uh, 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 really poor families. Anyhow, um, uh, there were two posters on the side of the building which attracted my attention. Uh, one was uh, Solomon and Bathsheba, and the other poster was... Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, West Side Story. And they were juxtaposed. Uh, I think there was a window or something in between. And uh, uh, it was my interest in uh, show, uh, filming or making photographs of images within images. And so I, uh, I filmed the interior and then uh, the step-by-step -step demolition of the building. So that was uh, like a documentary uh, effort. So in a way, bo both of those moving image works, which you're not s specifically known for, were kind of about the mechanics of those media. And I mean, that's I, I, that would be a pretty s simple way to describe your photography, though, too. It's so, it's so much photography about photography and images about Images. Do you think that seems like you're a fair yeah, you're characterization? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and have the, I mean I, I I think this is a pretty rare treat for us to get a chance to see this. This is from 1964, right? And and has you've really not shown it very often in public. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Uh, just a few times. I mean, it, to me, it feels very very contemporary, and it feels like lots of more recent artists, you know, might be attracted to doing something very similar to that, something that's very self-referential. And, and, uh, and I mean, I think that's why this exhibition's come about, because it feels like your work from the 60s to now um, is so playful and irreverent and critical and kind of poking at the assumptions of, of photography, or in this case, film, that, and so, so many younger artists seem to be also very occupied with that today. But, um, so, th so this feels like another great contribution to that to that history in a way. <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
I guess. What am I going to say? Yeah, that wasn't. I didn't. I didn't frame You're that. Wrong. I didn't frame that very well as a question, but, 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 um, I mean, for for me, that that again is the reason why this show felt so pertinent to put on right now, and where it, because again, you you have this irreverence with photography. You, it almost is is as if you don't take it overly seriously, and you kind of trouble photography in a way. Where where did you? get that idea and 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 did it meet with resistance when you first started making pictures that uh, that didn't take photography so seriously oh that's a that's a good question i uh it's hard to answer actually uh, i i just uh i i love humor <clears throat> i love humor and uh i i try to I introduce that in, my, in in some of my work and it's um, it's rather difficult. Uh, uh, photogra- I'm sure a lot of you have made photographs that you're at a uh, p- in a particular situation that is uh, rambunctious or it's very funny and uh, like a, a gathering of people, and and it's very difficult to photograph and capture that feeling. Uh, so uh, it, it takes it takes a lot of work to uh, uh, introduce humor uh, and have people understand that it's humorous. Uh, so I, I'm not sure where it comes from. I, I guess it's my personality. I don't. Know. But was the, when you were f- first started making pictures like this, did you sense uh, an over like a self-seriousness maybe within the the world of photography where you felt like you needed to disrupt some things? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right about that. I uh, I, I thought, I, I, I was, um, I had uh, t- teachers, uh, Minor White was one, and I was at RIT, which was very uh, traditional in, in uh, their view of photography. And... Uh, it was, uh, I, I saw it as uh, overly serious uh, and uh, reverent or whatever. And I, I thought uh, that uh, it needed to be uh, maybe not quite so much that way. Uh, so uh, some, uh, like I, I have one series that I, I deal with that is uh, uh, references to the history of photography, which uh, I was taught to really love by Beaumont Newhall, the uh, historian and writer of uh, uh, the history of photography. And uh, so I'm very taken by the history, and I, 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 I make references as a, a tribute to the medium and, and people uh, that I admire a lot as photographers. And R- RIT is Rochester Institute uh, of Technology, yes. right? And and isn't R- Rochester, New York, also where Co- Kodak Film yeah, was Kodak invented or based? Yeah, w- Kodak was based there and uh, manufactured film and everything. Yeah. So so you were really at ground zero of the history of, of photography, studying there in the place where it was invented, essentially. Right. And uh, there's, a d- uh, at that time, it was called George Eastman House, where George lived, and uh, we, as freshmen, uh, very early, we made a, they we were taken a, uh, to tour that, and uh, everyone was looking for the blood on the rug because he uh, committed suicide with a revolver, but no one found it. <laughs> they had cleaned it up. <laughs> well. What, was your was your humor well received at that time when you were you know obviously you still have it but um, I mean where, did people did you get kicked out of any of your classes for doing some of the things that you did or did you no but they they didn't really care for me introducing myself into the picture or uh, staging anything uh, uh, they didn't uh, really. Uh, uh, see that as a good idea, particularly. But uh, I remember uh, another tour of uh, Kodak Park, it was called, where they manufactured everything. And I was like 
I don't know, 19 years old or 18, I forget, but when I started. And uh, they took us through this tour, and we went through a room where there were mainly women were uh, rolling film in, in, into cassettes. And uh, so they were very anonymous. So they were, they were calling out all these very rude things to us, uh, sexual things, you know, and everything, and amusing each other as workers, you know. That's, I remember that. <laughs> It seems like one one of the strategies that you really pioneered in a lot of ways is kind of somehow trying to pull back the curtain almost on the illusion of a photographic image where where we're often trained to and just accustomed to look at a picture and feel like we were there we're standing there and it's a window onto some kind of reality that that has been captured. But you f have come up with all these kinds of devices to sort of disrupt that, to make us realize, oh, there was a photographer behind this, he or she was pointing at this angle, or you sometimes also making us aware that this is just a piece of paper with some emulsion on it and things like that. Can you, can you talk about how that um, approach developed? Yeah, uh, I was always, uh, I was taken with uh motion pictures, uh, I really loved watching motion pictures. And uh, I was on a couple motion picture sets too, but um, it was all, like all the things around what was being filmed, like the, uh, the sound equipment and the, the lighting equipment was all right just off the screen. Uh, and I, kind of wanted to uh, show how, how the image was being made. And uh, so it came from that uh, primarily, I think. One of the, th the things that about your photographs that resonate into our current moment, I think, is um, all of us becoming a bit more skeptical of, of how a picture is made, if there's been retouching and photoshopping and all of that, which of course didn't really exist in, you know, at, in that form um, when you were making photographs. But I, I'm still really curious about this questioning of the photographic truth. Was there, was there anything political behind that? Did you feel like you, were, like you or, or your peers were being misled by images that, were, that you were seeing in the media or in newspapers or anything like that that made you want to kind of slap people and say, wake up, you've got to look at these pictures more, more carefully or more critically? Um, hmm. I had a hard time answering that one, but... Um, I worked for Chrysler Corporation for a while, and uh, there there was uh, a lot of uh, retouching done on on, on the automobiles. Uh, at one point, uh, this was in 1958, when uh, the cars were. Uh, relatively long in, in, in size and uh, when we were photographing the automobiles we used a special lens that elongated the car to make it even look longer and it was stretching out and we'd have to have the lens uh, working in the center of the car so they had to redesign the lock to make it oval um, because of the stretching, right? And you couldn't have any of the models nearby because they'd look like, uh, you know, these funny mirrors. Uh, uh, so uh, <laughs> um, maybe that had something to do with it. <laughs> uh, so no, I can't draw you into a political... Uh, no, I, I, it wasn't political. Okay. Uh, I, was. I mean, I've never sensed that in our conversations, but I ju it just made me wonder whether, you know, in, the, in that period, whether... There was some other external motivation, but it's more about the mechanics of how pictures are made and yes. films are made and things right. like that. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, one other innovation that I think we see in the exhibition is um, is a rather small photograph, as most of yours are, where a picture has been assembled using lots of other pictures to kind of create almost a collage, and the 
the depth of field and everything is different from each little piece to another so that there's a really strange sense of space. And we also have a David Hockney photograph or a collaged photograph in the exhibition that's 10 years later than that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was really amazing to see that you were already experimenting with that, you know, much before he, um, you know, really popularized that, that form of, of almost this cubist kind of uh, collage photography. Can you talk a little bit about how you came into that and, and even w how you viewed Hockney's later use of that same technique? Well, I, I wrote David Hockney and I, I told him that I thought he was doing a really good idea, <coughs> doing some really interesting work with my idea. Uh, <laughs> he never returned uh, you know, a letter or anything, but... <laughs> um, I, I wanted to, uh, let me see, well, I don't know how I came about doing that exactly. Um, I wanted, uh, I've always been interested in sequential ideas, and uh, that, that was another sequential idea where uh, I f photographed uh, some this activity in a supermarket parking lot, and I kept the camera was on a tripod so there was no movement of the of the of, of the camera except I kept rephotographing the same scene as it changed uh, people and cars and uh, a particular couple that uh, appear in three different parts of the image so it's a sequential thing that's fractured and there was a, a large uh, it's up in the uh, exhibition, a large um, uh, out, uh, uh, outdoor sign which holds it together uh, to make it convincing and it's the same place. Uh, but all of these different things are going on within that space, but the, uh, the sign never changes. You know. um, we, we just have a few examples of that you know, true kind of collage effect uh, in, in the exhibition, but is that something that you continue to, to play with for a long time, and, and even would you say that you continue to do that today, or is that something that you kind of um, work to? I, I haven't, end? not recently, uh, but um, I, I like uh, f forensic photography, uh, I look, like looking at it. I, I did go through uh, uh, some police files one time, and, and uh, Pittsburgh, uh, and uh, the the photographs that they made for evidence uh, purposes of evidence were very precise and uh, uh, very convincing that they were truthful, and uh, so I I, uh, I I had these postcards that were older than. And then the time when I was making my my own photographs, so I would find the spot where the previous photo photographer was to make the postcard, and make my own black and white image, and then I uh, put together uh, pieces of the color postcard, uh, somewhat, and the the effect was somewhat the same as that supermarket uh, uh, piece I did. And uh, it was a, a way of introducing color because I, I had studied color at RIT and it was very difficult at that time to print color and I thought um, it was such a waste of time and I'd rather do black and white, which was much quicker. Uh, and so I haven't done much color work except some XX70s, which I love the, that color uh, at that time. but. Um, but these collages were a, a way of me introducing color in, into my own work, and, and I liked the um, contrast between the color and the black and white, uh, and how that functioned, and uh, the, the way the space functioned, and the way it uh, recorded time changes, and uh, so. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's one that's been showing up here behind us, but we have a great example of that in the exhibition in the MCA's collection of Lakeshore Drive, 
or along the lake shore yes. there with mm-hmm. this very recognizable view and the c- postcard collaged onto the actual photograph that you took of that right. same scene. And I didn't think I could do it at first. I, I uh, going trying to find the same exact place and using uh, a lens that I thought was the same focal length, um, but it worked. I was able to do it. I, I, I didn't think it was going to work, but it did. And I was very happy about that. That's great. Um, one other kind of technical kind of question, or maybe inside baseball kind of question. So many of the ideas in your pictures, even if they're 40, 50 years old, feel incredibly fresh, and incredibly relevant. But the scale of your, your work does sort of, you know, place it in a certain time and place, you know, and especially because currently the, a lot of people working with photography now are really tempted to go really big with, and with using color, which you already talked about. Can you, can you talk about, about that and, and if you ever were tempted to go, go big like some of these, you know, later generations of, of artists working with photography might have done and, and, and or like why you intended to kind of stay on this more intimate, small scale? Um. Yes, uh, the, uh, well, m- one of the things I found with artists, if, if they have a small space that they work in, uh, their work is usually a small scale for, you know, because of that. Uh, and uh, I can print up to a certain size in my dark room, uh, 16 by 20 inches is the largest I can do. Uh, I mean, I could have someone else print the work, um, which I'm not inclined to do. But uh, now when you can digitize negatives, I've had some pieces done uh, uh, 30 uh, by 40 uh, inches, which is a reasonably good size. Uh, And uh, the quality of the image, uh, the digital image, is uh, so close to my own printed image that uh, I'm very happy with it, you know. So uh, there, are, there are some larger images that I've produced, but uh, very, very few. Um. Maybe uh, before we open it up to some, some questions, I ask you kind of a, a, big, a big picture question in terms of which is, um, you know, you've been in this field for a long time and really made some amazing contributions to it. Where do you see photography today and do you see uh, a healthy future for it in terms of it being able to grow and to uh, to push push boundaries into the future? Uh, yeah, before I, I, I answer that question, uh, the other thing is uh, I, I like the idea of um, uh, kind of intimate experience with the photograph that you do have to get close to it and it kind of feels uh, like intimacy. Anyhow, uh, I I think there's so many possibilities now with uh, digital uh, photography, which, by the way, I I don't do, Um, but uh, uh, I just have, I, I have such a investment in traditional photography, I, I, I just hesitate to go into digital photography. But I can, since I, I don't work in it, I don't see all the possibilities, but I've viewed a, a lot of possibilities, like the instant recall of, of the image that you just made is just wonderful. I, I used to use a Polaroid to uh, do that, you know, that took a little bit of time, but now you have an instant recall, and uh, because uh, I think everything has moved to instant gratification is, is something that people seem to want, uh, and digital photography certainly does that. Um, but, uh, with Photoshop and all these ways of altering the image, I mean, it's it's quite endless what you can accomplish. Uh, it just uh, it, it is wide open. Uh, it just uh, that's what I I I, I uh, 
I see, you know. And w even uh, it seems almost as if it, there's a, you know, a democratization of, of photography that anybody can, uh, and everybody uses and makes photographs all, all the time now. I mean, d does that feel distinctively different from even when maybe people had Polaroid cameras and brownie cameras and things like that? Does this feel materially different from that period when photography was becoming popularized in a different way? Well, um, the, the manufacturing of uh, cameras and, and uh, equipment has simplified uh, the tech, technical um, problems of, of making a picture. I mean, it's, uh, it's erased all of the things that, uh, that I kind of enjoy, all the mistakes and uh, uh, that were being made with uh, traditional work. Um, like moving, you know, shaking the camera or, I mean, then people, I know uh, other photographers have taken that and, and used that deliberately. Um, or, you know, multiple images by accident. Uh, 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 I've, I've done a lot of multiple images uh, that way. Uh, but a lot of ideas have been taken from uh, the accidents uh, of, of uh, uh, technical ac accidents of photography and, and uh, made into uh, very interesting images. Do you, do you think that since, especially as, as someone that was a longtime educator, do you think that since making of a picture with a camera has become so easy and all of those difficult steps and technology tech technical know-how that was needed before. It's almost made photography education um, irrelevant or unnecessary? Oh, um, no. I think um, uh, the thing that uh, separates uh, uh, that casual photography from serious photography uh, are ideas. Uh, and I think uh, if you have uh, an interesting idea, it's uh, uh, you can uh, produce work that is very meaningful to everyone. So I, I think the difference is uh, the mind uh, using the equipment in a, a very creative way uh, and not just a casual. Well, these casual images, I mean, they're very, they're very well done, but a lot of times they lack lack any kind of idea. Uh, that's a difference, I think. And, and that kind of level of critis criticality and discernment and things that, that someone learns in a, in a photographic, with photographic training and theory is, is what kind of separates the casual photographer from, yeah. from the serious, serious one and get, yields you probably a higher rate of successful pictures than, <laughs> than, than the casual photographer too, I would think. Yeah, I, I think it's much more difficult to make an accidental image now. And uh, I love accident and chance and how uh, that can uh, lead to some very interesting thoughts, uh, ideas. And uh, I, I live by uh, this uh, pastor's uh, um, uh, statement about uh, uh, chance uh, favors uh, the prepared mind. So if you have ideas, you know, circulated in your head uh, and you come upon something, you're prepared to, uh, to uh, you know, work with that or make, make something out of it. Right. Well, that seems like a good, a good spot maybe to, to stop. Um, do we, do we think, January, we have time to show the film one more time, just so, or should we launch into questions? Okay. Oh, I, I had one other story before oh, that. Oh, please, sure. If you, Sorry. <laughs> um, I was in an exhibition in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, uh, in the 70s, I think it was, and... Uh, the uh, 
There was a, not, it was a group show uh, of uh, a lot of different photographers, but one photographer who was in the show was uh, a man named Les Crims. And uh, there was uh, uh, someone was viewing the show and took offense of his photographs and uh, demanded that the uh, offending images be removed. Um, and uh, so I, I guess they didn't do anything for a while. So this person uh, kidnapped the uh, director's son uh, to hold hostage until the photographs would be removed. Uh, so uh, they, the show did just had a like a, a week or so to run, so they just closed the whole show, and, th and then the child was re you know released, but they never found out the identity of the uh, kidnapper, and I hope that doesn't happen to Michael, <laughs> any of his relatives because of this show. Me too. <laughs> Um, well, I know we have uh, microphones on either side of the auditorium, and so if anyone has questions, if you could raise your hand, we'll bring a microphone to you, um, and we'd love to, to entertain any questions you might have for Ken. Here's one. In the meantime, I wanted to thank Michael um, and, of course, the MCA and the Terror Foundation, which has made this whole thing res uh, possible. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, I feel honored being invited to do this. And I Yeah, yes, my, my question, Ken, was in regards to your um, friendship with Robert Heineken, and there's an amazing picture that's one of the more recent images uh, that's in the show upstairs. And I know you had a long relationship with him, professional um, exchange as a teacher and also as a fellow artist. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because he's, he was a very innovative photographer, but didn't make his own photographs like you make yours. Yeah. Um, yes, I'll, I'll tell you a story about uh, when he first started making images. He, uh, there, there were places in magazines uh, where you could order unexposed, or, I mean undeveloped film, rolls of undeveloped film of photographs of uh, uh, nude women. And, uh, and the reason for that was that you had to develop the film, it could, it could then be sent through the U.S. mail, which uh, you, you couldn't send photographs like that through. The, it was uh, 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 unlawful to do so. So um, he, he never really made his own pictures. He, he, he used uh, uh, images uh, from the media and uh, or like I just explained, these uh, images from uh, that he could could get in the mail, but um, uh, he he was a, a, a very uh, influential person. Uh, he, uh, for instance, um, I I really admired him in terms of some of the uh, guerrilla tactic, tactics he did during the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, if you remember, there was a famous photograph of uh, a Vietnamese soldier uh, holding uh, two severed heads. Um, and uh, he, he was protesting the, the Vietnam War. And one of the things he did was he uh, bought uh, 
fashion magazines off the newsstand or stole them, I forget which way. But anyhow, he would remove the pages and uh, would uh, offset print uh, this image uh, of the Vietnamese uh, soldier holding these severed heads uh, with uh, uh, hair ads and that sort of thing, you know. Uh, and then he would reassemble the magazine and put them back on the newsstand. Uh, so, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> do, you, do you want more detail? We have a question in the middle. Um, two, uh, actually. One, can you talk a little bit about uh, your relationship with uh, the photographer Joe Jockna, who sadly passed recently, and can you tell us whether you ate the bread? Oh, that's a good question, both of those. Um, I um, very much uh, admired Joe Jockna's uh, work. Uh, I, I, he was my classmate at ID. Uh, he uh, he was just this wonderful photographer who came up with these uh, glorious ideas continuously. Uh, he uh, he was just a, a very very good friend, and uh, uh, we exchanged ideas, you know, and uh, were very uh, supportive of each other. Um, the other question, uh, uh, no, by the time I photographed that bread, it wasn't edible. Uh, and no, I didn't bake it. I've, uh, people ask, uh, always ask me if I baked it. No, I got it at, I got two loaves at a, uh, at a bakery, and one worked real well. Uh, I sliced it myself. Right <laughs> Any other questions for Ken? Maybe in, while someone gets their courage for the next question, I also wanted to, to thank uh, my co-curator of the show, Lauren Fulton, who worked on it. But I also s stand on the shoulders of Lynn Warren here on our team, who organized a retrospective of Ken's work here at the MCA back in 1983 and really helped, helped me bring more of Ken's work into the collection. So I also wanted to thank Lynn for that. I also wanted to thank Christy. She's done a great job putting this all together for us. Do we have a the Christy's question? over here. <laughs> Do we have a question in the front? Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite color? I'm sorry? <laughs> color. What is your favorite color? Well, two, black and white. <laughs> Oh, we have one more question over here on the far side. We'll we'll get it. We'll bring a mic to you if we can. <laughs> Just a second, please. Uh, R.J. died. I was wondering if you worked with him or your thoughts or. Um, no, but uh, I, I liked a lot of his images. Uh, I, I met him one time. Uh, that was all. But, uh, uh, he was a good, good, good photographer. Um, I can say. I think the the one that I admired most was a uh, a, a child uh, in midair heading for a mattress. Uh, off a porch, you know, you know. Uh, and also um, didn't he uh, photograph uh, uh, Sartre's, uh, um, was it Sartre's um, lover? Simone, yeah, he photographed Simone uh, when she was uh, nude at a mirror uh, in a bathroom and he, he, she called him a naughty boy doing that. It's a good picture, though. Hi, Ken. Um, 
I wanted to just ask a little bit, since I think there are a lot of students, uh, current students of photography in the room, if you could talk a little bit about your philosophy of teaching photography at the time that you were teaching, um, and maybe this gets back to an earlier question about uh, digital and the work that's being done now in digital, but I remember, as your teaching assistant, um, how you broke down photography in a way that I think reflects a lot of what you do in your own work, but maybe you could talk a little bit about your teaching philosophy. Uh, yes, I, I, um, oh, I got another story that relates to this. I was teaching at ID for a short time, and uh, the basic, basic course, and the first th thing that uh, students were introduced to the medium as was uh, to make a photogram, uh, which is a cameraless image that you make in the dark room. Uh, <clears throat> you use light in a, a light-sensitive paper, which you then pro you expose and then process. Uh, so actually, your the result are like shadows um, that uh, turn out white, of course, and where there's no object or anything on the paper or between you, the light and the paper, it, it comes out lighter. Anyhow, uh, I briefly explained how a photogram was made and the, the class went into the dark room. And the student, uh, he uh, just cr uh, crumpled up the paper and then he uh, set it on fire, which w resulted in exposure of the paper and then, um, uh, then he uh, let it uh, burn for a little while, and then he put it out in the developing solution and fixed it and that sort of thing. And what turned out was this wonderful image that had creases and, you know, and uh, charred edges, and it was just a wonderful idea that uh, I was so jealous of, you know, that... Um, I should have followed his career because he must have done some other wonderful things like that. But anyhow, when I was teaching, I like to introduce a little bit of technique, but mostly talk about ideas, about how to use um, the camera, of course, uh, technically, but uh, how, how to use the space and, and light and... Uh, uh, time, uh, ideas. So the emphasis was on an idea with just enough technical information for the student to move on to the next thing. Uh, th that that was the way I taught, and uh, um, it it worked out pretty well. It's, it's I thought one one last hand shot up over there on the aisle. The show upstairs is in two parts. The first part is your photographs. The second part is uh, representation of the work of other artists. Were you curatorially involved with Michael in making the selection of those works? My uh, thought about uh, when I uh, approached for an exhibition is that the curator has different ideas than I have, and I uh, like to see them express their own ideas about how they're going to present my work. So I, I really don't have much say in, in what photographs are selected. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I just uh, trust the uh, curator to uh, do an interesting exhibition. Uh, and what was the other question? I'm sorry. Were you involved in the uh, selection of the items in the second part of the show? I guess the, you know, the other artists, the not... The oh, no, 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 I wasn't. Uh, no. But um, there were some wonderful images uh, there. Uh, Great. Well, I, th I think uh, maybe we should let you all go upstairs and see the exhibition if you haven't seen it yet. I, I wanted to make one little commercial plug, which you might have noticed that 
I'm wearing a name patch that says Ken and Tom's wearing a name patch that says Ken in January. So we made uh, this brilliant idea um, from Marilyn Zimmerwoman, who's been collecting Ken patches, name patches, um, and we all have decided to make some of these ourselves, and so they're available in the store upstairs too if you also want to be like Ken and wear a, a Ken patch around town and make people scratch their heads when they, when they see you and know that your name's not Ken. And, but, and, and Marilyn's my partner, and she's a good lover. Ha, ha, ha.